to hear a Sherlock Holmes adventure, adapted by Edith Miser, a famous novel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, entitled The Hound of the Baskerville. Tonight's story will be the fifth installment in our tale. You need have no doubt as to its interest to you, however. Even if you miss the previous installments, you will find this episode a thrilling story in itself. Dr. Watson, it's nice to see you again. I was worried you weren't going to make it. Yes, well, I'd not tamed my whiskers in a few days, and it was getting scruffy and unseemly. Mrs. Hudson, and of course Holmes, did not approve. So I decided I'd better shave before I came. I will admit I would have been even later than this had I not remembered a gift given to me by a colleague earlier this month. And what gift was that, Dr. Watson? Wouldn't you believe it? An electric razor. It works swimmingly and rather quickly, too. Got rid of the bristles much faster than my standard blade did. An electric razor? Well, that's certainly new. Would you mind telling me more about it? Easiest, smoothest shave of my life. Easy to clean and store, too. It's got a bit of a price to it, but it's worth it for all the time you'll save shaving in the morning. Well, don't keep me waiting. Who makes it? John Meyer's the name. They've been in the shaving business for a long time, so you know you're getting the best. Well, our thanks to John Myers and their new electric razor for Dr. Watson's extra speedy shave. Now, I'm excited to return to tonight's mystery. Well, we left off with Sir Henry Baskerville and me out on the moors, and that mysterious figure silhouetted against the moon. Sir Henry was convinced it had something to do with the curse of the Baskervilles, the large, black, spectral hound which was supposed to haunt the family, and which the peasants around Baskerville Hall claimed to have seen the night Sir Charles Baskerville was found dead. You remember, Holmes sent me out to Baskerville Hall to protect the new heir, Sir Henry, a young Canadian. I was given strict instructions to write Holmes the details of everything that occurred. Well, to resume the story, it was in the afternoon following our nocturnal sally out onto the moors to try and capture the escaped convict named Selden, the brother-in-law of Barrymore, Sir Henry's butler. You'll be glad to know we did get back safely. Our nerves a bit shattered. Well, the next day was dull and foggy, with a drizzle of rain. Neither Sir Henry nor I had stirred out of doors. The house was banked in rolling clouds, which lifted now and then to show the dreary curves of the moor, with thin silver veins on the sides of the hills, and the distant boulders gleaming where the light struck their wet faces. Everything was melancholy outside and in, the old house had a feeling of gloom and dread about it, as though some horrible danger were lurking near at hand, ready to strike. I was seated at the writing table, scribbling off my notes to Holmes. Sir Henry, in a black reaction, after the excitement of the night before, paced restlessly up and down in front of the fire. Watson, I can't get it out of my head. The sound of the cursed dog bang on the moors. It's this beastly weather, Baskerville. Enough to jangle anyone's nerves. You... you don't think they're right? Dr. Mortimer, Stapleton, and all the rest? You don't think it's possible there is a curse on my family? And that some... some wretched ghost of a dog is waiting out there on the moors? Waiting to get me? Rubbish. A spectral hound which leaves material footsteps and that fills the air with a quite audible howling. That's not very logical, huh? No, I suppose not. And yet, if there really is some gigantic hound loose on these moors, where is it concealed? Where does it get its food? Why isn't it ever seen in the daytime? I know it's difficult to explain, but there must be some natural solution. Pull yourself together, Baskerville. Surely you're not going to descend to the level of the peasants who aren't content with making the animal a fiend dog. 
but go on to describe him with hellfire shooting from his mouth and eyes. You may argue now, tell Doomsday, Watson, but you can't deny you heard that hound last night. I heard a hound, of course, but that doesn't make it the Baskerville hound, does it? And apart from the devil, there is the fact that a human agency is mixed up in all this puzzle. The man in the cab, the letter warning you against the moor. Yes, I've been trying to find an explanation for all that, too. Did he remain in London? Has he followed us down here? Watson, do you, do you think he might be the stranger we saw last night standing on the tour? Hmm. I wonder. I only got a glimpse of him, of course, before he disappeared. But I'd be willing to swear he didn't resemble anyone we've met hereabouts. No, his figure was taller than Stapleton's. And thinner than Franklin's. Yes. Besides, it's impossible to imagine Franklin prowling about at night. He's only interested in those ridiculous lawsuits of his. Watson, that figure. There was something sinister, almost macabre about it. I know it sounds absurd, but you don't suppose... You don't suppose it's the hound itself? What do you mean? Something like a werewolf that changes from a man to an animal and back again. Good heavens, no! That's... Well, that's like witchcraft and black magic and all that stuff and nonsense. It's... It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Yes, but... But how do you know... I... Well, I know. That's all. It isn't reasonable. I wonder. Look here, it must be the stranger. The man who dogged your footsteps in London. Dogged? A figure of speech. An unfortunate figure of speech. I shouldn't have used it. This man followed you about. We've probably never shaken him off. Yes, but if he's down here, where is he staying? Why has no one seen him? He may be hiding out there on the moors. In this weather? Why not? There are all those prehistoric stone huts, remember? That brute Selden, the escaped criminal, is living out there, isn't he? Yes, but he has a reason. A good reason. It's a matter of life and death to him. Who knows? This stranger may have an equally strong reason. Whatever it is, he means no good. I'll stake my life on that. If only we could lay our hands on the fellow. I'd wager he could give us plenty of information. You may as well search for a needle in a haystack as to try to find a man who wants to stay hidden on those cursed moors. Oh, that reminds me. Betty Moore seems to think he has a grievance. How so? He seems to think it was unfair of us to try to hunt for his brother-in-law, inasmuch as he told us of his own free will that the man was hiding out there. Yes, but it wasn't of his own free will. We forced him to tell us. What's more... The man's a dangerous criminal. Think of the harm he might do. There's no safety for anyone until he's under lock and key. That's what I told Barrymore. But he promises Selden will do no further harm. He says he's made arrangements so that he can leave for South America in a few days. If only we don't inform the police of his whereabouts in the meantime. I don't know what to say. Well, of course. If he were safely out of the country... It would relieve the taxpayers of a burden. Besides, I can't very well mention the matter to the police without implicating Betty Moore and his wife for shielding the fellow. How deuce take it! Let's not meddle in it, huh? We've got enough on our hands without that. That's my idea exactly, Walson. Glad you agree with me. Oh, give that bell rope a pull, will you? And we'll tell Betty Moore our decision, eh? Right. Well, Watson, we're aiding and abetting a felony. But I'd never feel right about it if we'd given the man up. Come in, Bettymore. Oh, Bettymore, uh, Dr. Watson and I have decided to forget what she told us about the escaped convict. If you'll guarantee to have him out of the country inside of a week. I promise, Sir Henry, on my word of honour. And God bless you, sir. You'll mean the world and all to poor Mrs. Barrymore. Don't mention it, Bettymore. Don't mention it. Oh, by the way... Did my new clothes come from the tailor? He promised I should have them today. Why, yes, sir. They're a bit wrinkled after the trip from London. I'm pressing them for you myself, sir. Good. Now I can get rid of my old wardrobe. You won't have to be ashamed of my appearance any longer, Barrymore. Why, Sir Henry, I'm sure we've never been anything but proud of the new master. 
ever since you came, sir. Thank you, Bertimore. And there's one thing more, if you'll pardon my mentioning it. My wife seems to feel you might think it's important, and you've been so kind. Anything we can do in return? Yes, Bertimore? I didn't find it out till after the inquest. It's about poor Sir Charles's death. Do you know how he died? No, sir. That I don't. What then? I know why he went out to the Moorgate. It was to meet a woman. To meet a woman? My uncle? Yes, sir. That's why I didn't like to mention it before. But my wife says... Quite right. What was the woman's name? That I don't know, sir. But her initials were LL. By Jove! How do you know that? Well, sir, Sir Charles usually had a large stack of letters each morning. Being a gentleman with a kind heart, everyone was glad to turn to him when in trouble. Yes. Uh, go on. But that morning, the day he died, there was only one letter. That's how I happened to take particular notice of it. It was from Coombe Tracy, addressed in a woman's hand. But the LL, how did you discover that? Only a few days ago. My wife was cleaning out Sir Charles' study. She found the ashes of a burned letter in back of the grate. Most of it was gone, but one little bit sort of hung together. And you could still read the writing. Splendid. What did it say? As you are a gentleman, burn this letter and be at the gate by ten. And it was signed LL. Did you save the slip of paper? No, sir. It crumbled to bits when we moved it. Have you any idea who this LL can be? No, sir. That I haven't. Uh, never mind. We'll ask Dr. Mortimer when he comes to dinner tonight. He knows every chicken child for miles around. Will that be all, sir? Yes, Betty Moore. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, Baskerville, what do you make of that piece of news? It seems to leave the darkness darker than ever. I'm not so sure. L.L. Perhaps those initials will prove to be the key to this entire mystery. Have another cigar, Dr. Mortimer. Thank you, Sir Henry. I will. Ugh, what a night. The moors are practically flooded, and Grimp and Mar is becoming more treacherous every moment. Have you found your spaniel, Dr. Mortimer? No, I haven't, Dr. Watson. I've whistled till I'm blue in the face. I can't imagine why he ran away. Poor little fellow. I hope someone's taken him in. By the way, Dr. Mortimer, I suppose you know very nearly everyone living in this district. Well, there's a few gypsies and pedlars I can't answer for, but among the farmers and gentry there isn't anyone I haven't tended at one time or another. Do you know of any woman whose initials are LL? LL? No, I can't say I do. Hold on, though. There's Laura Lyons. Her initials are LL, but she lives at Coombe Tracy. Who is Laura Lyons? Why, she's Franklin's daughter. You mean old Franklin? who's always having lawsuits. Exactly. She married an artist named Lyons. He turned out to be a thorough blackguard and deserted her. I'm not saying she wasn't as much at fault as he was. She's a handsome piece. But forwards, if you know what I mean. <laughs> of course. Well, her father disinherited her because she married without his consent. And for other reasons, too, I'm told. How does she support herself? Well, her story got about, of course. Several people did what they could to help her earn an honest living. Anyone in particular? Yes. Stapleton and Sir Henry set her up in a typewriting business. Typewriting, huh? Yes. But why all this curiosity? What has Laura Lyons got to do with the mystery of Baskerville Hall? Uh, oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Look here, Mortimer. If you and Dr. Watson have finished your conversation about the fascinating Mrs. Lyons, what do you say to a game of écarté? Splendid. Good. We'll go into the game room. Will you join us, Watson? No, thanks. You can tell Barrymore to bring my coffee in here. I have a postscript to add to my letter to Holmes. Right. Come along, Mortimer. Laura Lyons. Hmm. I wonder why she wanted to see Sir Charles. Your coffee, sir. Oh, thank you, Barrymore. Just put it down here, will you? Very good, sir. Oh, Barrymore. Have you seen your brother-in-law since last night? No, sir. But the food I left for him was gone. So he must be around somewhere. Unless 
unless it was the other man who took it. The other man? What do you mean? And there's another man living out there on the moor. Selden told me. He's seen him. He's hiding too, but he's not a convict. Hmm. I don't like that, Bettymore. Nor do I, Dr. Watson. There's foul play somewhere. There's black villainy brewing. I'll swear to it. Look at Sir Charles's death and the noises on the moor at night. Now that man waiting out there. What's he waiting for? That's what I want to know. But I'm wasting your time, sir. I beg pardon. Yes. What's he waiting out there for? In the wind and the rain? What's the answer to that question? I wonder if Lord Lyons knows. Oh, darling, I thought you were never... Oh, I beg your pardon. I I was expecting someone else. I'm sorry, Mrs. Lyons. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all. Please come in. You want some typing done? Well, no, not exactly. I'm Dr. Watson. I'm staying with Sir Henry at the hall. And, of course, I've had the pleasure of meeting your father. So I thought... <laughs> There's nothing in common between my father and myself. If it weren't for the kindness of the late Sir Charles Baskerville, I could have starved, for all my father cared. As a matter of fact, it's about the late Sir Charles Baskerville I came to see you. Sir Charles? But I... that is... what can I tell you about him? You knew him, didn't you? He helped me on several occasions. Did you correspond with him? What is the object of all of these questions, Dr. Watson? The object is to avoid a public scandal. It would be wiser to answer my questions than to let matters pass out of our control. Very well. What are your questions? Did you correspond with Sir Charles? Yes. Have you ever met him? Once or twice when he came to Coombe Tracy, Mr. Stapleton carried out most of the business between us. Did you ever write Sir Charles suggesting a meeting? Certainly not. Not, not even on the day of his death, Miss Lyons? I, no, no. Surely your memory deceives you. Your letter ended, be at the gate at ten o'clock, and you signed it L.L. But I, I never kept the appointment. I swear by everything I hold sacred. Why not? Something intervened to present a private matter, I can't tell you. Why did you insist Sir Charles should destroy your letter? If you've read it, surely you know. I didn't say I'd read all the letter. The letter itself was burned. Only the postscript was legible. But you haven't answered me. Why did you want Sir Charles to destroy the letter? It's... it's a very private matter. All the more reason for avoiding a public investigation. Very well. I just learned that there was a prospect of gaining a divorce. If... if I could find the money. It meant everything to me. Peace of mind, self-respect. I had to see Sir Charles that night. I knew that he was about to leave for London the next day. And yet you didn't go? No, I... I received help from another source in the meantime. Oh, you must believe me, you must! I got the money and started the divorce proceedings. You can look it up in the records. It's true! I don't know anything about Sir Charles's death. I don't know! I don't know! <sighs> the Lord deliver me from hysterical women! I don't know any more than I did when I went to Coombe Tracy. And now the sun's setting. It'll be dark before I get back to Baskerville Hall. There's the moor to cross, confound it! <sighs> Wish the place didn't look so gloomy. That black tor where that figure stood and all those stone huts. I wonder which one he's hiding in. What if he jumps out at me? <laughs> What's that? Oh, 
Oh, it's only old Franklin. Thank heaven for that. Hello there, Dr. Watson. Congratulate me, man. Congratulate me. Why? What's happened? It's a red-letter day for me, sir. I've had a double victory. You don't say. Yes, that ought to teach them the laws, and that old Franklin isn't afraid to enforce them. Why? What have you done now? I've established a right-of-way right through the center of Middleton's Park. Yes, sir, slap across it, within a hundred yards of his front door. We'll teach those country magnates. They can't ride roughshod over the rights of the commoners. Confound them. <laughs> really? But that's not all. No, sir, the best is yet to come. I've closed the wood where the Fenworthy people used to picnic. These infernal people seem to think there are no rights of property, and they can swarm where they like with their bottles and papers. Well, well, I haven't had such a day since I had Sir John Morland up for trespassing because he shot in his own warren. <laughs> How on earth did you do that? Unearthed an old ordinance. Time of Cromwell it was. Yes, sir, it cost me two hundred pounds, but I got my verdict. Did it do you any good? Certainly not. I'm proud to say I'm entirely disinterested in the matter. It's for the good of the community. That's what the authorities won't understand. Why, would you believe it? They called me a meddlesome old fool. Old fool, eh? I could tell them something they're dying to know. But nothing will induce me to say a word now. Not a word. Oh? You know something? Know something? That I do. What about the convict on the moors? The one they've been hunting for high and low? You... N you know where he is? Certainly I do. I haven't seen the man himself, but uh, I know where he's hiding right enough. And I know who brings him his food. Yes, but you won't tell. You said you won't tell. Indeed I won't. I it's a boy. A young boy. Comes over every day from Coombe Tracy. I've watched him through my telescope. He goes straight to one of those stone huts. The one standing in back of that black tor over there. The black tor? You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Didn't I see it with my own eyes? But enough of that. You'll come home and help me celebrate my victories, eh? I've some port that's been lying on my shelves over forty years. We'll open a bottle. What do you say? Uh, well, no, thank you just the same. I've got to get back to the hall. I don't like to be away from Sir Henry after dark. Oh, I understand how you feel. And it's almost dark now. Well, I won't be keeping you any longer. Good night, Dr. Watson. Good night. <laughs> Two verdicts in one day. Not bad, the not back bad. of the Black Tor. <laughs> so that's his hiding place. The chap that's waiting for us. I wonder what he's like. Oh, by Jove, I've half a mind to find out. <laughs> the moor looks desolate. Not a living thing. What's that? Oh, it's just a gull flying home. That black tor. How fantastic it looks in the fading light. Better not tackle him single-handed. And yet, another night. Heaven knows what may happen with that beast howling on the moors. <sighs> no time like the present, Watson. Come on, pull yourself together. Throw away your cigarette, old boy. That's the stuff. Easy. No use letting him know we're here. Get the old revolver handy. That's better. By Jove, there is a pathway. A vague sort of pathway through the boulders. And it leads to the door of the hut. Sinister looking place. What if he's waiting in there? Easy now. No. The place is empty. What's this? Blankets? And a waterproof covering? Cooking utensils? A loaf of bread? And a can of tinned tongue? This is the place, right enough. What's this pinned to that paper bag? It's a note, badly printed. Dr. Watson has gone to Coombe Tracy. Dr. Watson? Th then it's me he's after, not Sir Henry. It's me! What's that? Footsteps. He's coming back. He's coming. Closer. Closer. His shadow. His shadow's falling across the doorway. Lovely evening, Watson. Holmes? Holmes? Yes. 
You must be rather cramped, crouching in there. I really think you'll be more comfortable out of doors. And would you mind pointing that revolver the other way? Well, I'll bet you were glad to see Sherlock Holmes. Glad? I was never more delighted to see anyone in all my life. Heaven knows what I expected to come through that door. The devil himself, complete with horns and a tail, probably. Your nerves can play strange tricks on you out on those confounded moors. My, the moors must be desolate places, Dr. Watson. Oh, desolate is no word for it, Mr. Bell. Nothing I could tell you would make you realize how downright primitive they are. At least, not when we're sitting here in such great comfort with a good fire and shelter from the weather. Too true, Dr. Watson. And now, what will you tell us tomorrow? Well, I'll tell you the concluding installment of The Hound of the Baskervilles, in which we actually meet the spectral hound and learn how he caused one death and nearly fulfilled the curse. You have been listening to A Sherlock Holmes Adventure. Tune in tomorrow at this same station at 7 p.m. St. Paul time. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider donating to the Chaska High School Theatre Department to help fund future projects. You can mail your donations to Chaska High School, care of Mrs. Jane Herget, 545 Pioneer Trail, Chaska, Minnesota, 55318. This program comes to you from the CHS Studios in Minnesota.